Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Douglas and Sarah Allison Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on all of these occasions on our heritage.org website. I would ask everyone here in house if you'll be so kind to make that last check that cell phones have been turned off. It's always appreciated. <clears throat> Today's lecture is part of the Heritage Foundation's annual Protect America Month programming. During this period, we feature speeches by national leaders, special publications, as well as other events addressing the vital issue of protecting America in an increasingly challenging world. The namesake of this lecture series, who regrettably is not able to be here with us today, Colonel James D. McGinley, spent his entire career protecting America interests at home and abroad. At home, he had a noteworthy legal career. Some of us will forgive him for that. <laughs> Separately, Colonel McGinley served as a distinguished 30-year career as a naval aviator in the United States Marine Corps, which we commend him for. Focusing his leadership skills abroad, he volunteered for three combat tours and earned both the Legion of Merit and the Bronze Star. Colonel McGinley retired from the Marine Corps in April of 2013. His wife, Mary Beth Walton McGinley, has earned an admiral reputation of her own as a successful business owner and creative development leader for the entertainment industry. In 2002, she was appointed by President George W. Bush and confirmed by the full Senate to serve a six-year term as a member of the National Council on the Arts. The McGinleys are both dedicated to a host of important conservative issues from religious liberty to national defense. The Heritage Foundation is pleased and proud to honor these two great patriots through the annual James D. McGinley Lecture. Hosting and welcoming our special lecturer today is James Carafano, Dr. Carafano serves as Vice President of the Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Institute for National Security and Foreign Policy here at Heritage, and he is also the E.W. Richardson Fellow. Please join me in welcoming Jim Carafano. Jim. I have a great job. I, no, I love my job. I, this is an awesome place to work, and the, people, and the people that I work with are absolutely incredible. And it's just, I just love coming. But the best part is, I get to tell generals what to do. <laughs> I mean, how cool is that, right? So I'm going to ask General Drowdy to come up here, and I'm going to tell him what to do. And this is really cool for me, because, you know, I was basically the coffee maker and the guy hanging the hats in the back of the room. So, you know, but uh, and I'm going to ask him to do two things. One is I'm going to ask him to introduce one of the most remarkable Americans and a shaper of the national security of this country in the 21st century and just, just a man who is so accomplished and such a great defender of his nation that just to have him here is really awesome for us. And so General Drowdy has the task of trying to um, introduce him. But the other thing I'm going to do is ask him to talk about uh, a little bit about actually why we're here today. And that's to recognize an institution which, which Washington, D.C. needs to know a lot more about, which is the Marine Corps University Foundation, which is an extraordinary uh, foundation which serves an absolutely vital and essential educational institution to this country and its future. And I'm going to ask Tom, when he comes up, to talk a bit about the university and the foundation a bit, and then to introduce General Mattis. So, but to do that, I have to actually introduce General Rowdy, which is pretty awesome because when you have somebody who's dedicated their entire life to serving people in uniform, it's just an honor to, to talk about all that. So Tom is the president and chief executive officer of the Marine Corps University Foundation and, uh, and um, the distinguished chair of military studies. He is one of the university's most prized lecturers and just someone the students are always interested in learning from. And we, I've actually had Tom here up at, the, uh, at Heritage talking to our analysts about his vast knowledge about information operations and information warfare. He has been there since 2004. In addition uh, to, like I said, to being the head of the foundation, he teaches an elective course at the Command and Staff College. Um, before that, um, he was the senior vice president and general manager for USA Southeast Regional Office in Tampa, Florida where, again, he, he served our men and women in, in uniform. Um, it's a great organization that, that provides just great support to, 
men and women and, and, and the descendants of people who have been in the military. While he was in Tampa, he continued to teach. He was an adjunct professor at St. Leo University, teaching courses on the Vietnam War and War and Peace. Um, and he retired from there in 2003. Before that, he had one of the most remarkable careers uh, that you could say when you put the words U.S. Marine Corps and remarkable career together, that's really something. Um, over 30 years, he retired in 1993 as a Brigadier General. He had three, I gotta get this right, three tours in Vietnam as an infantry platoon leader, a company commander, and as advisor to the Vietnamese Marines in Vietnam and Cambodia. He taught at the Naval Academy and served as a company officer and brigade performance officer and he commanded the Marine Security Guards in Europe and the 5th Marines. He served as the Assistant Division Commander of the 1st Marine Division during Desert Shield and Desert Storm. He was responsible for the Marine Corps deception operations in the combat theater, um, <laughs> which is an extraordinary story in and of itself. Um, you know, every, all the Iraqis were looking north, waiting for the Marines to land while the Army went south. We really appreciated your help there. Um, <laughs> he retired. <laughs> As the Director of Public Affairs for the U.S. Marine Corps, which is an extraordinarily important duty, because you know the thing is like a Marine comes and then there's like three combat photographers and the, you know, reporters after him, so there's a lot of people to manage there. Um, he served on Presidential Commission on the Assignment of Men and Women in the Armed Forces. Uh, he received two Distinguished Service Medals, ten personal awards for combat, including two Silver Stars, a Legion of Merit, the Bronze Star, the Navy Commendation Medal, all with combat bees, and the most important medal that our nation um, bestows, the, the Purple Heart. So please join me in welcoming me, General Drowdy. Thank you very much for that uh, most generous uh, introduction, James. Thank you. And um, thanks to the Heritage Foundation, to the McKinley's, and to, uh, to Jim for making this uh, coalition that we have of the Heritage Foundation and the Marine Corps University Foundation. I will uh, answer your uh, request uh, to tell you a little bit about the uh, University Foundation um, with uh, what I call a shameless plug, and there's uh, more material here afterwards. But uh, I guess to get right to uh, what do we stand for, uh, we change lives and save lives, and we do that through this... Uh, education of our Marines and other services at the Marine Corps University. We're pleased to have here the President of the Marine Corps University and the Commanding General of the Education Command, Brigadier General Helen Pratt, who is uh, uh, responsible for uh, professional military education and leadership for the entire Marine Corps. So our foundation is privileged to have that opportunity to be basically the development arm for the uh, university, and we do that uh, joyfully. Jim talked about having a great job. Uh, from time to time, I tell my children, you, you have to give yourself the Sunday night test. And the Sunday night test is, are you looking forward to tomorrow morning? And uh, I truly look forward on Sunday night to Monday morning because I get a chance to continue to serve Marines and continue to take care of the youngsters who have done such a superb job of taking care of us. So uh, thank you for that opportunity. Uh, now it is my uh, honor to introduce my friend and comrade, uh, General Jim Mattis, and I've known him since our days in Desert Shield and Desert Storm uh, 24 years ago. Uh, his many successes and significant accomplishments are well known. Uh, Commander Central Command, U.S. Joint Forces Command, NATO's Supreme Allied Commander Transformation, uh, the first Marine Expeditionary Force Commander, uh, Marine Corps Combat Development Center, the first Marine Division, Task Force 58. I'm not going to talk about those successes. I'm going to talk about his failures. He has failed miserably to fit the Hollywood image of a Marine officer. <laughs> uh, as you can see, he has the looks, of course, but he just doesn't act like one. In Desert Storm, he led from the front and got as dirty and as grimy as his Marines and his beloved 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, part of Task Force Ripper, which was the focus of main effort for the 1st Marine Division. The writer and former Marine Lieutenant Nate Fick remembers seeing him as a general sharing a conversation and a fighting hole with a sergeant and a lance corporal 
in the middle of a freezing night. He was no asphalt soldat, no parade ground marine. He has failed often to tell his seniors what they wanted to hear rather than what they needed to hear. When you look up the phrase, speaking truth to power, there's a picture of Jim Mattis. And finally, he has failed to project the image of a cold, type A leader so focused on other matters that he forgets about the troops. Let me share a quick story with you. In 1998, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, my dearest friend, General Chuck Trulak and his wife, Zandi, delivered cookies on Christmas Day to the Marines on duty in the National Capital Region. Their last stop was Quantico. General Krulak arrived and asked the duty non-commissioned officer, uh, who is the officer of the day? And his response was, General Mattis. And General Krulak said, yeah, yeah, I know. I know the, the CG here is General Mattis. Who was the officer of the day? Response, General Mattis. In frustration, General Krulak goes over to the rack where the officer of the day sleeps and says, who slept in this rack last night? General Mattis. Just then, arriving with clanking of the sword, was the officer of the day, General Mattis. He was the officer of the day because the designated officer of the day was a major who had missed last Christmas with his family and because General Mattis was a bachelor, he took the duty so that that major could spend this Christmas with his family. Um, that's the kind of man that General Mattis is. Um, he is a Marine of many successes, um, but also some wonderful failures. And he exemplifies a saying that we've used from time to time, you can pretend to care but you cannot pretend to be there. Uh, Jim Mattis was there when the troops needed him and when his country needed him. It is my honor to, to introduce my dear friend and comrade, General Jim Mattis. Thanks, General Drowdy. Uh, if anybody uh, in my background represents the Vietnam generation most in my memory. It's General Drowdy. That was the generation that raised me as a Marine and made me the man I became. So when it was my time, my generation's time to stand and deliver, uh, the reason we were able to deliver if uh, there were some failures as well uh, is sitting right here. And I, I deeply appreciate all that you did for us, especially as you calmed my assault troops before we sent them into the minefields. So thank you. I don't forget my debts. And I would also uh, say, Jim, uh, thanks for Heritage having me here. I'll say a few more words about that. I just say for my fellow citizens who have not served in the military, I was not in the Marine Corps for 40 odd years. I was in the US Marine Corps, answerable to you, accountable to each one of you. And I'll speak for a little while, kind of close the gap here, talk about some things. I promised Jim Carafano, uh, soldier but PhD, that I would use multi-syllable words, so I found very erudite. Uh, but I would also say that uh, besides thanking, uh, thanking this wonderful Heritage Foundation, I'm, I'm part of Hoover, and in the free competition of ideas, you feel right at home here in, in Heritage, of course. But I would also thank uh, all in the Marine Corps in front of all of you for having allowed me to be in its ranks for so long. And I think it's discussions like these that we're having here tonight that allow us to make e pluribus unum, you know, out of many, one, kind of get together, talk about things, share ideas, perspectives, and come out maybe with, uh, with a little better understanding of some of the issues that we face today. Uh, I would tell you that uh, I turned down 95% of the requests to speak. I'm not interested in doing it. I do a lot on campuses now, uh, from Stanford to Dartmouth, Stanford where I live, to Berkeley, to uh, state schools and all. But as I reference, uh, dig through research material in order to talk to students, I often turn 
to heritage, uh, just like I do to Hoover. And I think when you look at the mandate for leadership, and I recommend if you have not read it, 1981, if I remember right, some 34 years ago when Heritage produced it, it's as applicable today as it was then. And it's the reason why at times when I'd testify on the Hill here wearing a uniform, I often went into these kind of documents in order to try to explain. It really, it was to close the gap, ladies and gentlemen, between human aspirations and war's grim realities. How do you bring that to bear in a way that gains the support of the elected representatives of this country? And from William Bennett's writing to the Lady Thatcher Center for Freedom, again, this is really a, a, a wonderful jewel that you have here. And Jim, I can see why you look forward to coming to work every day uh, for sure. Uh, I can't stand here today without mentioning, Stacy, your lad, Mark, um, and, uh, and Brandon, uh, two young infantry Marines, both from my beloved 7th Marines, which I once commanded, uh, both of whom lost our legs in combat, and both of whom uh, have an absolutely undiminished spirit. Uh, the only reason I stuck around that low-paying outfit for four decades was the absolute pleasure and sometimes the uh, being a little aghast at the high-spirited antics of these lads who would willingly go into minefields. I'd grown to hate minefields by age 21, but I grew to love people who would, who would move forward into them, and that's why I stuck around. I still remember walking up behind a squad of infantry Marines that these two represent and, uh, in, in a place called Ramadi, and I uh, walked up, and it was one of those days the enemy's shooting down the street at us, and we're shooting down our sailors, Marines shooting back down the street at them, and I walked up, and I, I uh, asked the squad leader, a uh, 20-year-old corporal, uh, the single most inane question that has ever been asked of a squad leader in combat in 240-odd years of history of the Marine Corps. I said, hey, guys, what's going on? <laughs> and the squad leader, convinced that his village idiot had somehow escaped and gotten out there in a general's uniform, dropped his rifle for a moment and said, General, not to worry, we're just taking the fun out of fundamentalism over here. <laughs> and I turned around and walked off smiling. One more riotous excursion of the human spirit uh, it was, uh, was underway, and I had no doubt what the outcome would be. So I, just to you and every one of your shipmates who've paid such a price and whose spirits continue to reward all of us with a sense of purpose, just I salute both of you who carry forward what we're talking about today, the foreign policy of the country on those critical last 600 meters against our enemy that seek out, close with, and will destroy that enemy. Uh, in talking uh, to Jim about how to address this time tonight, because kind of talk for a few minutes and then open to the good part, the Q&A, I thought I would just address what is happening with the lack of strategy uh, it's something I testified on in front of Senator McCain's Senate Armed Service Committee here at the end of January. But the bottom line is we do not have a global strategy. We do not. I just got back 36 hours ago from the Middle East, by the way, and it took three Red Bulls to get up here tonight. It's, <laughs> if I start talking a little fast, just wave your hand, I'll slow down. Uh, but I would just tell you we're going to have to anticipate increased turbulence in the world. And uh, that volatility uh, is going to get to the point that chaos threatens. This is a reality. It's not a very uh, fun reality to talk about. But at the same time, I've never thought it necessary to patronize the American people. And if you look at uh, the foreseeable future as not being foreseeable, in other words, there's going to be surprises. What you want to achieve are the fewest big surprises as we deal with this future. So you don't, you're not going to get it completely right. You just don't want to get it completely wrong as you look toward the future. And let's look back just a little bit at the greatest generation coming home from World War II. They look around. Who knows how many died? 50. I've seen 60 million. The Russians say 70 million died World War II. They say it's a pretty crummy world. But then they did something about it. And you and I have lived with that legacy. It's become part of our vernacular, the United Nations, a place to talk things over. Uh, the Marshall Plan, uh, where we actually turn to our enemies and we say we're not going to have another vindictive peace treaty. We're going to help them become good, responsible nations. And today, those enemies of World War II, one of the most vicious wars ever, are some of our biggest trading partners and allies. 
Uh, we also saw it in NATO, uh, where the ideas that grew out of the Enlightenment, we were going to defend them by allying with others, because we knew in history that the nation with the most allies generally wins. That's what history teaches us if we study it. And then, of course, there's Bretton Woods, and you and I know it as World Bank, as the International Monetary Fund. All these things were put together as they used traditional diplomatic tools, and they also used traditional economic means and new ones adapted to the situation. Bretton Woods, as you know, has adapted over the years. And the end result is, using those, they develop a world order. There'd never been a world order ever. There were regional orders, and then we take the European regional order, and in some ways we impose it over the rest of the world, and that's what we have today. The problem, I believe, is, and again, remember Einstein, you know, if he had 60 minutes to save the world, he was asked how would he order his thoughts. He said, I'd take 55 minutes to define the problem, then I'd save the world in five minutes. So if you define the problem, it is how do we sustain this world order, and right now, we have an America that is starting to reduce its role in the world. Uh, that's not good. Believe me, I was just out in uh, the Middle East. And whether it is right or not, the perception is we are pulling back and into that vacuum are going some rather unsavory uh, impulses on the parts of many people. Let me just drive uh, some of the ideas home looking at Russia, China in the Southeast, the South China Sea, and then uh, in the Mideast, the place that uh, has me still going through therapy two years after I left CENTCOM. Um, I, I would just tell you that as you look at the Russia situation, I think it is much more severe and much more serious than uh, we have acknowledged. And I recognize that right now America has not kept its fiscal house in order, and I, I recognize the danger there. Uh, a country that loses control of its budget loses its ability to govern. And when you couple that with the lack of political military strategy in both Washington and Brussels, where NATO headquarters is, and you have the largely unilateral disarmament of most, uh, or downsizing the militaries of most Western democracies, then you understand that you've got a lot of things starting to line up to tell you it's going the wrong direction. The problems run very deep, and I think the indicators are obvious. Washington is unable to govern. I've been in the last year in Budapest, Brussels, London, Amman, Abu Dhabi, Canberra. Uh, I can go on. There is more governing going on in any one of those capitals than there is in Washington, D.C. right now. Uh, sequestration was designed to be so stupid that it would force the Congress to do something. It was unsuccessful, and now we are governing ourselves stupidly. Uh, the European Union has proven unable to solve the Euro crisis now. We're, what, five years into this? And they can't do it. And, and then you can go on, too, and look at what the European Union did by offering to Ukraine uh, a trade pact and then standing mute as that triggers a Russian response. And basically, uh, now they just want the problem to go away. So in Russia, Ukraine, I consider it likely the most dangerous situation in a crisis-strewn region. And the, there is the potential, I believe, that Putin has unleashed forces that he will be personally unable to control. And I think that his successor, should he die before 2024, which isn't likely, but if something should go wrong, I don't think his successor could control the impulses he's released there. It is very, very hard to pull back from some of the statements he's made about the West. And I think that right now uh, there are people questioning, has Putin gone crazy? Is he delusional? And I think that what we have to look at is that we have a Russia problem, not just a Putin problem. People say when Putin leaves, it'll all get better. I think that's a pipe dream. Uh, Russia has the longest borders in the world. It's in a terrible strategic position. It has more violent jihadists in Russia right now than any other country outside the Middle East. This is not an insignificant problem for them. Uh, they're economically on an unsound footing. Their demographic situation is serious and worsening. So many of their males are dying of tuberculosis, HIV, and alcoholism that they actually have declining uh, longevity for their males. And so many of their girls have used uh, abortion as birth control that can no longer carry to term. There is nothing Russia can do to reverse its demographic decline. It's, it's, it's arithmetic at this point. 
That means Russia is going to be in a position where it cannot sustain its influence over its maritime and geographic borders at some time in the future. And they're now trapped uh, looking at NATO as a, as a threat. Uh, they do not see having democratic nations on their borders as a good thing. They want security through instability. At the same time, there's a nuclear context to this. They've threatened Warsaw and Danish warships with nuclear strikes. We have, uh, I live in California, San Francisco area, and there's been Russian uh, nuclear-capable bombers as far down as along the California coast. They're up alongside Scotland. They're outside Norway. And this is not an insignificant problem. The person who threatened on their national news one night to, uh, to turn uh, the America into radioactive ash was promptly promoted by Putin and put into the government's Ministry of Information. So this is where miscalculations can happen. What has happened in Crimea and the Ukraine is war. You can call it whatever you want, but it is war. They may do it in a way that makes it deniable so they don't trigger Article 5, but Putin goes to bed at night knowing he can break all the rules and the West will try to follow the rules. That is a very dangerous dichotomy in the way the world is being run. And until Secretary Kerry's meeting, I think it was yesterday, there has been no dialogue at all with Putin. And that is very dangerous. I mean, the whole point that the greatest generation found was if you don't talk about these things, things can go wrong. That's why they put the UN together. And I would just tell you that anything the West does now that seems reasonable to some degree uh, as we try to downplay or, or, or bring the crisis down into a lower level of boil is now seen as really a sign of weakness on our part, I think, by Putin, who is out to break NATO apart. I think that goes without saying at this point. So the midterm, the short-term danger is there could be a miscalculation. In midterm, uh, Russia's declining influence means that the Russian Federation could actually break apart, and that's not in our best interest. You do not want to break Russia right now and have those loose nukes all over the place. There's got to be some kind of a way to walk Russia back from this precipice, and yet the West is not showing the degree of unity. The Americans appear indifferent. The Europeans are bury basically burying their head in the sand. What I found most interesting was a Chinese, I was told by a friend, how the Chinese looked at it. You notice the Chinese have been silent about going into the Donetsk Basin and, the, and Crimea. The Chinese view was Ukraine lost Crimea, Russia lost Ukraine as a trading partner, and they needed her for both arms industry and the breadbasket. NATO and the Americans lost Russia as a partner, and there was some partnering going on over the last you know, 20 years or so. But here's the important one and the world lost stability. That's the way the Chinese look at it. And so I would just tell you that right now, we, let, let me turn to the China situation. I want to get through this so we have time for questions. But here you've got a muscular China today shouldering aside smaller nations out there in the South China Sea. Basically, Russia is trying to create a sphere of influence of unstable states along its periphery, intimidated. So the state system's under attack there. China is trying to use the tribute model. They're not, they, they aren't going to do it the same way the Russians are doing it, but they want to have a veto authority over the economic, the diplomatic, the uh, security uh, situation in each of the countries around their periphery. And they've used this in the past in history. I think they're less apt to use their military the way that the, uh, the Russians have. The Chinese have probably hit the end of, the, of this uh, I would just call it the um, shift from this, the rural areas to the cities and the low wages and the, all that sort of thing. Wages are going to start going up, and they need stability very, very badly in their country. This is the first generation in 200 years that's not going through trauma, whether you call it the, uh, you know, the uh, opium wars, the Boxer Revolution, the warlords, the Chinese uh, World War II, the communist takeover. Uh, the Cultural Revolution, it just goes on and on and on. And I was reminded, I was with Admiral Mullen, our former chairman this afternoon, and his, his counterpart, when Admiral Mullen asked him in one of their meetings, what's your biggest worry? He, he expected, well, I need, you know, I need more airplanes, I need more ships, I want tanks. You know how generals are, you know, we want these things. 
And the guy said, no, 10 million new jobs a year to maintain internal stability. They do not need that external turmoil right now. That's why what Russia has done is scared them, I think, to some degree, uh, as far as uh, creating challenges for them. At the same time, uh, they are muscular. They're, they want to write new rules for the international game. And I think that the, the demographics there, too, are ugly. So there's a little bit of a time clock on them right now. But I, I would also add that they are doing a pretty good job of finding friction points between our allies, like between South Korea and Japan, and, and exaggerating those and working those. And you find them doing this all around the South China Sea periphery and out into the Pacific with some of the little island nations out there. Uh, the wild card, as in Russia, is nationalism. And we've seen it kind of unleashed toward Japan a little bit. And I was just reading in a Chinese per periodical about uh, uh, Asia for the Asians. Sounds a little bit like the Japanese co-prosperity sphere, doesn't it, for those who've studied the, the history there. So, and it was interesting that ASEAN, which has always been a very mild, meek organization, I don't think they've ever said anything bad about anybody in their entire history. And ASEAN came out 10 days ago or two weeks ago, and they said that uh, what the Chinese were doing on the South China Sea Islands was undermining peace and security. Interesting comment as they start gelling an international coalition against them. And I think that when you look at the uh, Russia and China put together now, you see them both attacking the state system in different ways. Uh, Putin wants instability along his borders. He sees that as giving Mother Russia uh, protection. China wants tribute. But both of them tell other nations, you cannot be treated as an equal. You will, you will pay homage to them. And nationalism is key to both of the leaders in both Beijing and Moscow as they try to put this, this, uh, their, their view of world order together. And furthermore, are you uh, recording this, young lady? Well, no, that's okay, but I, I hope that doesn't go out to uh, the, the media, okay? No. All right, no, sweet. If it's just for you, that's no problem, and I promise not to say any bad words, okay? <laughs> Um, but uh, what I tell you what really worries me is that the, uh, there's no dialogue between Washington and Moscow, between Washington and Beijing. And if you go back to the Nixon era, you go back to the Carter era, you go back to Reagan, you find intense dialogues going on. And, and I don't see that right now. And I think that right now China's the more difficult problem, actually, but in the, in the near term, I think the most dangerous might be Russia. I saved the best for last, and, uh, the, and that is the Middle East. I first sailed into those waters, by the way, in 1979. I still remember one night we were sweating, throwing stuff on board helicopter, and I looked around. We were flying back out to the ships, our, our beloved Navy ships, and uh, I looked around and said, I am never coming back to this crazy part of the world. <laughs> you have to be very careful when you tell a Commandant Marine Corps what you're never going to do again. <laughs> Had I known I was going to spend most of my adult life out there, fighting there, studying there, serving there, uh, I probably would have found a different line of work, uh, <laughs> frankly. But uh, this Sunni-Shia holy war uh, is fast becoming a reality. It's the worst turmoil, certainly in our lifetimes, probably going back to the fall of the Ottoman uh, there back in uh, World War I time frame. But terrorism is only part of the problem. Uh, the larger issue, again, is the nation-state is breaking down, and these armed bands, uh, whether you call them AQAP in the Arabian Peninsula, Yemen, targeted against us, if you uh, call them, uh, you know, Lebanese Hezbollah, uh, basically they're armed groups. They can't really govern completely, but they also cannot prove, they have not proven to be defeated uh, so far. And I think that with the United States, we're dealing with each issue tactically as one-off, and when you do that, when you don't have an integrated regional strategy based upon clear political end states, read President Emeritus of Dartmouth University, Jim Wright's article in Atlantic, July 2013, how did we get into Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, and we don't know how to end these wars. If we don't have clear political end states, you end up in a situation where you deal with each issue one by one making second and third order issues that then work directly against you again. And this is, this is what would be called uh, a poor grade at the National War College. 
uh, to say the least. They, they would have flunked you. But absent any broader strategic context, uh, we're going to continue dealing tactically with things and turn over a worse situation in the Middle East to our children than we had. Um, I, an example, uh, the U.S. is at war with ISIS in one country, in Iraq. I'm not sure what we're doing with them in Syria. Um, and we still lack uh, strategy to achieve whatever is the political goal. And you hear different words being used, destroy, uh, degrade, these kind of things. We don't really have a good strategy right now. And as this Sunni-Shia war widens, remember there are two fundamental strains of terrorism. Now, one of them starts in about 1983, declares war in the United States. You know them as Lebanese Hezbollah, funded, supported by the, uh, the folks in Tehran. They blow up our embassy in Beirut. They hit the French paratrooper barracks, U.S. Marine barracks, that sort of thing. They blow up, uh, they, they kill Israeli tourists in Bulgaria. And, and they tried to murder the Saudi ambassador uh, less than about five miles from where we're sitting right now. And we did nothing about it. We caught them red-handed. It was not a rogue operation. It was directed from the very top. We did nothing about it. Uh, we put one lad in jail, uh, but absent one mistake, absent one mistake, they'd have pulled it off and they'd have set off that bomb in Georgetown on a Saturday night at Cafe Milano right outside. And you know what Georgetown is like on a Saturday night. You can imagine what would have happened. They came very close to pulling it off. One mistake or they would have done it. The other group, of course, you know well, uh, and that is Al-Qaeda, and we have shredded them in many places, but as you know, they have mutated, and from Boko Haram to Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, from Al-Shabaab in Somalia, Yemen, uh, of course, Al-Nusra, and ISIS up in Syria, uh, they, have, they have certainly gotten stronger. And so you end up in this situation right now where a lack of strategy again means you've got another attack on the nation state, in the caliphate's idea, you simply remove borders. They're literally bulldozing the border between Iran and, excuse me, Iraq and Syria. But their whole idea is one that is based on an assumption that the Americans will not ask one fundamental question. And that question is, is political Islam in the best interests of the United States? I suggest the answer is no, but then you know, we, we need to have the discussion. If we won't even ask the question, then how do we ever get to the point of recognizing which is our side in the fight? And if we don't take our own side in this fight, we are leaving others adrift. I just got back from Cairo, spent uh, four days there, and they are beyond the point of accepting that this is incompetent or a lack of strategic thinking. They believe now, even the more cosmopolitan people there are trying to say, you've got to be intending this. You've got to mean that you really do like the Muslim brothers and uh, who, by the way, just had an audience down here at Foggy Bottom in this town. It is very hard. I had a young lady take me aside, and she said, does your country's leaders, do they understand that my mother was educated, I have my advanced degree from a university in, in uh, England, do they understand that if the brothers or these other guys take over, and they're all swimming in, she put it, in the same sea, that you're looking at the last generation of educated women in Egypt. Do they understand this? I said, no, probably not. Because if they understood it, they, they would do something about it. Because as Churchill put it, you know, once you exhaust all possible alternatives, the Americans will do the right thing, you know? But we have not even come to the point of grasping the question, of honestly asking the question. So what you have is recognizing, for example, that if Assad was to fall, that would be the biggest strategic setback for the Iranians in the last 35 years. And yet, we don't address it. We address it simply as dealing with Syria and Assad alone in one country. That's not sufficient. You need to look at the way it's integrated together. And the idea that it's complex, I hear this, well, it's more complex today. Really? More complex than post-Napoleonic Europe? I'd suggest that would only be accepted by someone who's never read about post-Napoleonic Europe where borders are wiped out, countries are wiped out, or post-World War II, where we had to issue Nansen passports. They were called nonsense passports, but people didn't even have a home that they could relate to, so the UN had to give them passports so they could walk, wander around the world and show who they were. Their country didn't even exist anymore. 
It's not that complex today. It's only complex today for those who've not read their history books. And, and so I'm, I'm rather uh, impatient with that sort of thing. Uh, I think, too, you have to look at if you say you're going to ask the questions and say, is political Islam in our best interest, then you find the people who want to stick with you. And I'll give you an example that we've got friends out there, very intense friends who've stood by us through thick and thin. I was a commander at CENTCOM. Uh, I get the word that the French and the British have got to pull their troops out, basically domestic political pressure. They couldn't withstand it anymore. They had to start pulling their troops out. First thing I get is a phone call from the United Arab Emirates, a country we in the U.S. military call Little Sparta because they always stick with us. And they, the, I get the phone call, and they say, we understand the French and British are pulling out. You're going to have to go to the Americans again for more troops. I had 60 nations basically on my staff. In CENTCOM, we had 50 nations in the largest wartime coalition in modern history fighting together in Afghanistan. I said, yeah, I'm going to have to do that. He said, well, you're not going to have to do it for all of them. He said, we're going to send in six more fighter planes and another company of special forces to try and take up some of the pressure so you don't have to go back to the Americans again. I said, well, that's great, thanks. And they, they had them on their way there literally within days. It was no long workup or anything. They had them ready to go. I was flying into Amman. I had to meet with the king uh, there about his situation with the Syrian refugees that were pouring over the border. And uh, after we got done, I, I met him down at his place down at Aqaba. I'd known him since he was crown prince. We have a good relationship. I said, tell me what it's like to be a king. I've never been one. You know, like, what's a king do, you know? And, and he, he's telling me what he's doing and everything. And he said, by the way, he said, I heard the French and the British are pulling out of Afghanistan. I said, yeah, that, that's right, Your Majesty. He said, well, let me just make sure you understand that our troops, Jordanian troops, will be there with you until the last American soldier comes home. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you cannot buy allies like that. The way you're, you get allies like that is if you want a friend when you're in trouble, you need to be a friend of them when they're in trouble. And we are not sending that message. I was getting asked the same questions in Cairo and Riyadh as I was being asked in Tel Aviv after a while, and that's darn near impossible to align them. And how much have we aligned them? I had a foreign minister of an Arab country make a point to me right after I started wearing this instead of a uniform. He tried and looked at me. I was in his office uh, over there in the Gulf, and he said, we today have more in common with Israel's foreign policy than we have with America's. That is not a good situation for stability, and anyone who wants peace and prosperity and turn over a better world to our children, that is not something we can be proud of. It's not the way the greatest generation dealt with the world around them, and it's one that we're going to have to uh, adapt to or we're going to end up in a situation where we're ashamed of what we're turning over. But leaving allies adrift and having to accommodate less pleasing allies, this is not something that's in uh, America's best interest. I would just close by saying we have two powers. One is the power of inspiration. One is the power of intimidation. I was part of the power of intimidation, as those of you in the military, Helen, uh, General, uh, always uh, have been. But we have gotten to a point where in America, the, we've ta constantly turned over the last 10, 15 years to the CIA and the military because of the elements of our government that are best organized to compete in this violent political argument. But Dr. Nadia Shadlow has written about this, and she says, we need to get USAID, State Department, what we used to call Radio Free Europe, and we've organized in some weird way called the Broadcast Board of Governors, which is by Secretary Clinton's ad admission is totally screwed up. We've got to get other ways of competing. Traditional diplomacy, economic programs. I used to go up to Capitol Hill and say, if you're not going to fund the State Department fully, these diplomats who wear suits and dirty boots as they out there in the field taking risks, then would you please vote more ammunition, more money for ammunition, I'm going to have to shoot more people. That was my way of putting it into a Marine infantryman's persuasive vernacular for these folks. So as we, as we go forward right now, I would just give you four words coming back from the Middle East, and I copied these off Colonel Frank Hoffman, by the way. We use D words a lot in the military. Do you want to degrade it? Do you want to destroy it? Do you want to delay it? Let me give you four D words. Increase disorder, increase discontent, uh, we are going to see more decay of the international system if we do not sustain it, don't work to sustain it, 
and disillusionment among uh, our people. Increasingly in the democracies, people feel let down by their political leadership, and people are wondering if democracy can really deliver good government. So it's a gloomy uh, situation, but I think, too, that it's one that we can reverse. It has to do with defining the problem, getting young people who are unburdened with some of the old ways of looking at things and uh, who are well-schooled, they've done their homework, and give them advice. But we need a hydraulic, I think, to bring young people up into position of leadership because I think that what has happened so far is a disgrace by this generation. And the best thing we can do is move some young folks up, guys and gals who are aggressive, have initiative and vision, and are unapologetic about American values. Uh, and that's the way I would, I would close on. I would, I would stay positive. I have no doubt we can turn this around, but uh, this town right now is one of the biggest impediments to progress. It's not one of the biggest sources of, uh, I would just call it confidence for a way ahead, other than and sending diplomats and infantrymen into harm's way on tactical issues is not the way to get us back on track. So let me stop on that high note, Jim. <laughs> Thank you. I am a two-time Marine mom, and I want to thank General Mattis for getting both my boys home in one piece. Yeah, thanks, Barbara. <laughs> we had a good dinner together a few years ago. And to those Marines who are here, I want to, our whole family honors you. Thank you very much for your service. Um, General, when you spoke, you talked, um, I just wrote down a few comments that you made that triggered a thought. Um, it's hard to define the problem when the American people, especially the families of the wounded and the killed, have, I feel, not been told the truth. Uh, and I, I don't mean this in an accusatory fashion at all. We know that a lot of our wounded and killed in Iraq and Afghanistan were wounded and killed by Iran. It wasn't just what happened in Lebanon all those years ago, and it isn't just what would have happened at the Cafe Milano. But we continued to send our kids over there when both Democrat and Republican administrations knew that the Iranians were manufacturing and training and doing all the things that they've done in Iraq and Afghanistan, and they've never had to pay the price for it. I. I know that there are documents inside the Pentagon that are not classified but have not been released, which I think now that we're negotiating with Iran ought to be put forward so that the American people are not patronized mm -hmm. and so that they have a good concept of what questions need to be asked and, and what questions need to be answered. Okay, um, Barbara, I, I wouldn't uh, disagree about uh, Iran. Uh, they, had, they have five threats. One is latent nuclear, one is cyber, one is ballistic missile, one is counter maritime, and one is what I just lump in as Quds Force, MOIS, surrogates, proxies, Lebanese Hezbollah terrorists, that sort of thing. <clears throat> I thought Secretary Clinton would fail in driving them to the uh, negotiating table with economic means. Uh, I was wrong, she was successful, but once there, uh, an old general told me, be careful. He said, remember, this is, a, this is a team that has never won a war and never lost a negotiation. And sure enough, they were able to limit the negotiation to one element, which was the nuclear. So I understand what you're saying. I think it's more of a symptom, though, Barbara, of the underlying lack of a strategy, which is based on our unwillingness to ask the most fundamental strategic questions and come up with, uh, with a sound strategy, which means political ends laid out by our political leadership that are achievable, and then taking the diplomatic, the economic, the educational 
informational CIA covert and military means and integrating them well together to achieve those ends. And had we done that, I think we would not have, for example, tolerated safe havens or we would not have gone into the war. You know, you see what I'm driving at? So that's why you want to have the discipline of a strategy. But look where I went for my strategic advice when I was a four-star combatant commander. I'd go to Henry Kissinger, Newt Gingrich, I never got into his politics, he's a historian, Hugh Strawn at Oxford University, Colin Gray at Reading University, Colin Powell, General Zinni, General Abizade. Notice I did not mention one serving foreign service or U.S. military officer. We have a strategic atrophy in America right now, and what you're driving at is simply, uh, to me, a symptom of that malaise that we face. But I, I, I take issue with nothing that you just said. Yes, sir. All right, all right. Didn't just one minute. But there is another Marine on here, so I did. Hi, General. Um, Kerry Pickett with the uh, Daily Caller. Um, just wanted, just was wondering if you could address the uh, situation with the Islamic State. Uh, was curious here. You told the uh, House Intel Committee that quote we should do what is necessary to create havoc, humiliation for our adversaries. Uh, do you think that the U.S. has done enough right now as far as the Islamic State is concerned? Um, that we what should we be doing as, as far as Islamic State is concerned? And we are now seeing uh, ISIS um, coming to our shores that we saw over in Garland, Texas, et cetera, et cetera. Can you talk about that? Well, I, first of all, I think, you know, you got these punks, these wannabes go to Garland. They say we're part of ISIS. I mean, they self-enlist. And I wouldn't dignify them with that level. I, I, I just accept they're punks. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give them a whole lot of credibility along those lines. The problem is the threat, though, and you're quite right there, that people sign up for this sort of thing. Uh, I think it's pretty obvious. I mean, the president came out and said we didn't have a strategy on this. I mean, I, I would only uh, endorse what he said. Um, I mean, I mean, honesty is honesty. I mean, it's it's not some. Uh, I think the president's recognized the 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 failing there. Uh, and I think if we do not do something to humiliate them and cause havoc, their recruiting and their fundraising will continue apace. So there's got, you've got to hit them with a shock wave, and that's not just military, it's not just covert, it's a whole lot of things. But again, it goes back to you've got to ask the strategic question, is political Islam in our best interest? And let me define it. It's Political Islam, as practiced by the mullahs in Tehran for the last 30 years, that's on the Shia side. It's political Islam as practiced by the Muslim brothers, the brothers in Cairo for a year. And if it's not in our best interest, what are we going to do to come up with that coherent strategy? And that's the way I would address it. And by the way, President el-Sisi, a, a leader in Egypt, goes out to Al-Azhar University, the, the greatest university in all of Arabdom, all of the Arab world. It, it's the most authoritative, and he has all the clerics out there from various branches and everything, uh, and he chews them out, basically. And he said, it is your rhetoric that is enraging the world, that's endangering the world, that's creating this hatred of our religion. You need to change your, we need a revolution in your rhetoric because you're infuriating the world against us. And so that's part of humiliating and creating havoc, too, where the religious leaders move against this. It's all got to be put together would be the way I'd answer that question. And clearly, we're still finding our way forward. You know, I, I think that's pretty, pretty obvious. Did that answer your question? Uh, my name is Kami Bhatt. I'm with the Pakistani Spectator. And General, my question is about uh, Afghanistan. And I asked this question to both uh, Mr. Mike Mullen and uh, Secretary of Defense, then uh, uh, Leon Panata, that what did we get out of Afghanistan by giving a couple of thousand of lives and spending trillion of dollars while this issue cannot be resolved without resolving Kashmir issue? Mike Mullen's answer is on rec rec uh, record. record. Uh, he gave answer at uh, Carnegie Endowment, and so is uh, Lingan Panatas. So I would ask you the same question, because sure. we get involved with those international uh, issues, and then we are manipulated by the country who are very local, and they keep 
playing with us, they suck us in, and then they, we don't get anywhere, and we waste our time, we waste our resources, and then we leave, like we are doing in Afghanistan. So is there any long-term solution of this? And I asked the same question to an Israeli prime minister that which president is smarter, the one who's give a couple of thousand of lives, couple of thousand lives in Iraq, uh, spent trillion of dollars, or Obama, who has the approach that let these crazy Muslims fight with each other. They've been doing for 1,500 years. We cannot resolve their problem. Mm -hmm. Let's kill them each other. Who is smarter? Israeli prime minister smiled. He said he was not going to give me answer. Well, then the first, I asked yeah, his answer let, in let me, private. Uh, let, okay, let, me, uh, let me give you a little bit of an answer here. You, you're dealing with an infantryman. You've got to slow down here, OK? Um, first of all, um, let me just tell you in front of this audience, uh, after 9-11, I flew into Islamabad. And when I, uh, we went in on the deepest penetrating amphibious assault in Marine Corps history, 350 nautical miles in, uh, the, the Pakistani army knew H hour, they knew D-Day, they knew the objective three weeks in advance. They never revealed it, and they supported us all the way through. And we have had our difficulties between our nations, but there were times when we've stood together as well. And I hope that that is the future. Both Afghanistan and Pakistan, I think, are doing a much better job today, especially with Ashraf Ghani now in, in office in Kabul. And I think there's a lot of reason for optimism about how you deal with this enemy. And just for the Americans here, the Pakistani army has lost more troops in this fight against this enemy than all of NATO combined. There, that's arithmetic. That, we're all entitled to our own opinions. That's a fact. Uh, and we, we have had our differences, and there's no doubt there's been gross disappointments on, on both sides. But I would tell you on Kashmir, uh, I've studied the issue closely, and I don't think there's anything the Americans can do on this. I think on Sir Creek and I think on the glacier, you all could solve this, and I think you may yet solve it, and I think you could open the economic borders, and that would be a large part of undercutting the enemy's message of hatred. But since the enemy started moving out of the, the federally administered tribal area down into the, the, uh, the uh, settled areas, uh, Karachi, you know, the SWAT, all that, uh, I think it has cleared the uh, Pakistani military and the government's mind that they've got to fight them. And I think at the same time, uh, there's some movement, there was for a little while, of collaboration among all three countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. But if those three countries don't want to work together, the enemy's gonna work those seams in between you, and your innocent people are going to die. And there, there, it has nothing to do with religion, this part. The, the, that is nothing more than a, than a way they try to excuse their hatred and lust for power. And the way they treat women, the way they treat religious minorities, the way they treat innocent, there is nothing devout about people who kill women and children, nothing. And so you're going to have to decide how much you're willing to work with others that you have had troubles with in order to defeat them. But I don't think there's anything the Americans can do on Kashmir because I don't think the protagonists want peace there. They don't want to, uh, what would you call it, I kind of uh, be moderate on the issue and, and try to figure it out. and. If you all don't want to do it, the Americans aren't going to be able to bring some new idea to the table. That's my best answer I can give you. I know it's not a great one. Hi. Uh, thank you, General Mattis. My name is Ian Everhart. I'm a former intern here at the Asian Studies Center. I was just wondering if you see any parallels between the time we're living through now and the late 1970s and whether it it gives you any optimism or hope that, after all, yeah. Jimmy Carter was <laughs> succeeded by Ronald Reagan? Um, I, I'd like to see, I mean, I talk to anyone, left, right, or center, running for office that's trying to solve problems and trying to bring unity of the American people. I don't mind a good argument any time. I like talk to people who don't agree with me. Frankly, that's why I go to a lot of college campuses, you know? <laughs> Um, uh, and by the way, I find most of my problems are with people with my color hair. The young people are remarkably open-minded. They want to know what works. Uh, it's very, very interesting. 
Uh, some are wary of the military because they are brought up to be, but most of them will question that sort of thing. So I think that uh, if we could spot that kind of leader, Republican or Democrat, uh, there would be a way out of this mess. Uh, I go all the way back to the 1930s and look at what was going on then with the Western democracies, uh, but I don't see the troublesome young men that Winston Churchill gave voice to warning you, this guy, Hitler, he means what he's saying. I don't see that sort of defense of the Enlightenment and its values that came down to us given voice in our Declaration and our Constitution. And I, uh, I worry about it. I think what we need is someone who's been a governor of a state where he did a good job or she did a good job, I don't, you know, whatever, and dealt with a legislature that was controlled by an opposing party but had to deal with a balanced budget requirement, which most of the states have, not all of them. So they had to deliver governmental services through some kind of compromise, which is what our system of government is based on. You must have compromise and, and do it without breaking the bank. Because right now, uh, if, we, if we don't get our national debt under control, there is nothing we can do about keeping a strong military. It will not remain strong if you don't do that. So you've got to define the problem, find the kind of leadership that you're talking about there, and then it's got to be rewarded. Countries get the, the leadership they reward, and right now we appear to be rewarding the wrong thing from our gerrymandered districts all the way up to an entitlement approach that, that rivals Greece's in terms of irresponsibility toward people your age. General uh, Eric Lebson, I uh, met you when I was at the NSC a, a yeah. while back. Yeah. Um, we've always talked about the relationship with the UK and with Israel as though they're special relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I know you mentioned a, a little while ago you'd been to Canberra. I wonder, in light of some of the difficulties that both of those countries have had with this administration, what advice you would give to the Australians about how they can look at their relationship with the US especially as they're facing uh, increasing challenges with China. It was in Australia, but another, uh, an officer that I'd known since we were lieutenants together in the Western Pacific long, long ago, uh, in the last millennium, uh, he, after the red line was crossed in Syria a couple of years back, and, uh, and the Americans did nothing when it was crossed, uh, less than 48 hours later, this retired officer called and said, we know we're on our own with China. Immediately, that was the conclusion drawn in the Pacific from us doing nothing about Syria using those, those chemical weapons. Uh, I think what we have to show the world is we're a reliable ally, and we cannot wait for perfect allies. We can't wait until countries that just came out from under colonialism in the 1960s rival Britain in terms of 800 years, whatever it is, since the Magna Carta was signed. We're going to have to deal with allies that are imperfect just the way they have dealt with us when we were imperfect at times. And if we don't do that, it doesn't matter whether you're Australia, Israel, Britain, or NATO. I mean, you remember the Secretary General of NATO <clears throat> saying, we need to know if the Americans are with us a year ago? The Secretary General of NATO asked that question? Now, ladies and gentlemen, you know, we hold this country in usufruct. You know what that is? It's not a, not a dirty word for you young people. That <laughs> worried me the first time I read it. But basically, you know, it's like, it comes from a farmer's word, I think, where you can do whatever you want with the land. You can cut the trees down, reroute the stream, do whatever you want to do. But when you turn it over to your son or daughter, it must be in as good a shape or better than you received it. Now, most of us in this room were born here by complete accident. We live here by choice, but we have a responsibility to turn over this country and its relationship with other nations, responsible nations, uh, as good or better than we received it. And I don't think we're, that we're doing it right now. And I, don't, I think special relationships are, should be treasured, but we should also be willing to make, take non-traditional allies, or make allies of non-traditional Country have not traditionally been our ally. We need to be able to bring them on board. There are ones out there. I'll show you how much the power of inspiration is of America. My Marines on one occasion out in the western Euphrates River Valley told me when I was at uh, one of the 
patrol base where they'd picked up an IED layer the night before. He said, he's a really nice guy. He speaks English. He said, really? So I brought, had him brought over to me. He spoke very good English, as good as mine, engineer. And it was not a good night for him. You know, he's out there whistling. He's got his wheelbarrow, got his artillery around, got his wires, got his battery, you know, digging it in. Looks up, and there's six Marines standing around with automatic rifles. And so, you know, kind of early retirement for his career. <laughs> good engineer. Uh, so I, was t I, I started talking to him, gave him a cup of coffee and stuff. And he, you know, I said, why are you doing this? I mean, you're Sunni. You know the Marines out here are the only friends you got. Why, why are you doing this? He said, oh, you know, you Crusaders, you go home. I said, knock it off. You're an educated man. Just get over that. Now tell me why you're doing it. And after a while, he finally said, well, yeah, you know, you're right. He said, you know, in my, in my heart, I want you gone now. In my head, I know we need you guys out here. I said, okay. He said, I'm going to Abu Ghraib. Huh? I said, oh, yeah, you're going to Abu Ghraib. You've been wearing an orange jumpsuit for a long time. <laughs> and he said, when I get out, do you think I could immigrate to America? <laughs> but stop and think. How many people fighting in wars, where does the power of America really lie for these special friends or new friends that we could have? It's the power of inspiration, a guy literally trying to kill us, and he says, could I come to America? I don't know where you find that corollary in history of something like that. And I'm not saying this as some kind of propaganda kind of thing. This was, a real, this was in his words. He was educating me at this point. And the best thing I can tell you is we can use our power of inspiration and bring this community of nations of responsive governments together. And they may call their head of state a president. They may elect them. It may be a queen of England. It may be a king of Saudi Arabia. We can pull nations together and find common ground on security issues, even if we don't agree on everything else. And that should be the passport to working with America, not perfection. As a guy named Will Rogers put it, you know, it might surprise some Amer back in the banana wars, surprise some Americans to hear that most people prefer an imperfect government of their own choosing rather than a perfect government forced on them by the bayonets of U.S. Marines. Interesting point. Oh, absolutely. A couple more drinks, I'll be good to go for a while. We'll do three questions. We'll go right center. General Mike Julius, former soldier. Um, I want to pick up on one of your letters, you, inspiration. I forget what your last I was. I want to talk about one, integrity. You and I and many of those in this room grew up both on, with a family before we joined the military and then in our military career where integrity was the basis of everything we did with our troops. And, and even if you had a scent, particularly as an officer, if you had even a whiff that you were waffling or didn't have integrity, your career was done. You wouldn't have served 40 years. I wouldn't have served 30 years if that was the case. Um, it strikes me in our nation and even within our military industrial complex, but mainly on the military side and the government side that's getting involved, that, that that's not true. I mean, the integrity of our country is questionable. And I just wonder from your perspective, you, you've served and no one has ever questioned your integrity, nor should they, and you've been very candid throughout your career in uniform and out of uniform as to things you're talking about us today. But I'm wondering from your perspective, do you think that is somehow the problem? Because what we're seeing throughout the world, and I'm trying not to be political here or make a political statement, but we, we have the highest levels of leadership in our country, are still failing to acknowledge the role of Islam in terrorism. That, that the two words are not even used together, and at some point, I, from my interpretation, is that that's lying. It's, it's, it's deception. It's, it's not recognizing what is true. And getting back to your overarching point about a strategy, that we need a strategy, I think many of us were raised, in order to have a strategy, you have to define the problem. I mean, you have to, you know, your, yeah. your, your end state is clearly stated. But don't we have to be truthful with ourselves and with the American people as to what the threat is to our country before we can devise a strategy? And in your view, are we yeah. doing that? Yeah, My, it's a great question because here's why President Bush called it a global war on terror and not on Islamic terror or something, and why the current president doesn't want to, you, to put the two together either. And that is because as non-Muslims, we're liable to give a broader uh, dignity to the terrorists because it's linking their, their violence to Islam. 
And most, as you know, they've killed more Muslims than they've killed Christians, Jews, and everyone else, Hindus combined. And so it is tough, whether you're President Bush, anyone in a position of responsibility that looks at this is trying to parse out. But I think that's why you want to ask the question, is political Islam in our best interest? And if not, what are we doing to support the countervailing forces? Not to define it in terms of whether it's Islamic or not, but when the president of Egypt, the key Arab country, the third of all Arab people under, under his country, comes out and he challenges it, we should immediately come up on the second agenda and say, we believe in this man right here. I didn't see anything hardly in the newspapers about it. Here he was putting it, literally his life on the line. And what did we do in support of him? Nothing. In the United Arab Emirates, they, they refused to accept political Islam. In, uh, I mean, I, I can go on and on. So I, but when you change, now, now let's hold that thought and go over to your point about integrity. There is, a, there is personal integrity and there is managerial integrity. I think the personal integrity of most of our people is sound. I mean, I, I, if you listen to any one TV station, depending on who they like and who they don't, you'll, you'll think everybody's gone to hell in a handbasket, okay? But the fact is, when you wander around this town, you actually meet the men and women. They have a vision, and we, it may not be the one we share, but they're trying. But the managerial integrity seems to have broken down in our system. And so I would, I would depersonalize it a little bit, and I would look at it as how do we support those who agree that we want secular governments that protect religious people of any type. Notice when the uh, ISIS killed the Coptic Christians in Libya and President al-Sisi, a Muslim leader of a dominantly Muslim country, sends in his pilots to bomb them because they killed his Christians. He said, these are not a minority. These are Egyptians. We're going to defend Egyptians. And again, we did not come out in support of them. We won't ask the fundamental question that then allows us to align ourselves with those who have the courage and the integrity, both personal and managerial, to fight an enemy. And frankly, with two un, I would say two irreconcilable worldviews, I mean, you and I are never going to accept that girls don't go to school. I don't, I don't care what they do, we're not going to accept it. So we're going to fight. That's all there is to it. And I'm already on record as saying whether or not I support fighting them, you know, say. So, uh, no need to repeat it. But, uh, and thanks, Mike, for what you did for three decades. So we're a few last questions back here yeah. in front. Thank you very much. I am uh, Dr. Nisar Chaudhary, an analyst. Uh, Janet, it was really very enlightening to listen to you. And I must say that uh, the president of USA speaks uh, for the State of the Union address, and you are speaking about the state of the world. This, this is the gap here. It's not a political statement. But uh, for all this, you mentioned strategy you really emphasized. And at the same em time, say that again. you emphasized on strategy. Mm -hmm. But uh, the treatment which is gi being given to the patient is symptomatic. For strategy, you need the, have the capacity to look at the bigger picture and the ability to develop a strategy and then the courage and resolve to mm -hmm. stay firm-footed. I think that is a missing element. But when you talk of strategy, who would develop this strategy, and who will implement that strategy, and why they are not doing it? Why they're not? Yes. Uh, great question. I, I would go back. What happens in the 1950s? The United States changes the words, the meaning of strategy. And we turn it, you've heard of strategic air command, strategic weapons, nuclear weapons. And many in the military, because the, I, I mean, I was trained as a nuclear employment officer. It is very disheartening as you practice ending life on this planet, frankly. You, you look at it, no matter what some countries might think, when you go to nuclear, you're going to change things forever. Uh, so many people emotionally and intellectually moved away and said, I'm going to study tactics. After the disaster of Vietnam, the U.S. Army and U.S. Marines, through air land battle and through maneuver warfare, go to the <laughs> operational level, or what you and I call campaigning. But still, strategy was left to throw weights, to megatonnage, to, to submarines that slip out with big missiles on them. And the strategic atrophy left me dealing with people who are academicians and formerly and the Brent Scowcrofts and Henry Kissingers 
and Brzezinski's, people like this who actually think strategically. It is hard to do. Colin Gray in the United Kingdom has helped to define the strategic uh, atrophy that we face. But as far as if you don't have political willpower, you will never develop the strategy because it takes leadership's willpower because it is so disheartening to look that after 5,000 or 10,000 years of recorded history, we're still trying to kill each other on this planet. And those wars, those grim realities of warfare and human aspirations slam against each other with politicians who run because they want to bring good health care, good schools. And then in walks someone like me saying, you know, you know we're going to have to fight. And, and fighting is very hard to convey. It's not the, a politician's portfolio is brighter, but is... Uh, as Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., one of our most articulate uh, Supreme Court justices, said that uh, to veterans, we have faced the uh, incommunicable experience of war, and it is very hard to communicate it and achieve what you just asked about. It's just, it's human nature, and I, I understand it, I respect it, but we're good. if we want the values of the Enlightenment for us, for those of us who grew up in the West, and every nation, every culture has this, the bright side. Uh, if we want it to survive, we're going to have to fight. And that's a reality. But right now, without the willpower, we're not going to pull it off. But thank you for the question. Very good. Thank you. Good afternoon, General. It's a pleasure to hear you speak. And uh, I'd like to say I'd like to join your groupie list and follow you around and uh, listen to you at other some of your other venues and places that you've been invited to. But part of what you said, I believe, is not is off the record, right? As far as certain topics. That yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, the last thing I want to do, you know, again, I was a U.S. Marine, and uh, I, I may have a different world view than some political leaders, but I was apolitical for 40-odd years, and I'm not willing right now to condemn our president and think that does anything other than help our enemies. I just don't buy it. I have my arguments with them. Uh, I mean, I left office early. Let's be right up front about it. Uh, but we serve at the pleasure of the president. I support that constitution. And he eventually gets the military advice he desires. And that's what's going on. But I will not, you know, I'm, I'm from out west where you ride for the brand. You know, when you sign on, you don't go after the president. Uh, you don't ever do that. And there's no need to. And sitting in the back of the room is uh, Colonel Retired Mac Owens, who's written about the civil military relationship. And I would just tell you, you give your best military advice. You try to avoid antagonistic or adversarial relationships with the civilians. And when you get to four stars, you insist on being heard. And those of you who serve with me know that I can be quite insistent. <laughs> but you never insist on being obeyed. The president is our elected commander in chief, the only man elected by national vote in this country, and either you believe in the Constitution and you ride for the brand and you stand with them and loyalty only counts when there's a thousand reasons not to be. So that's where I come down on it. Now, I interrupted you, so ask this question. Thank you, thank you for that. I appreciate that. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Name's Todd Wiggins. So what is the soundbite, if you will, that would delicately address your relationship, your respectful relationship to, to our president at the same time, sort of uh, providing a, a call to action that the citizenry can consider when making decisions about future presidents or what should we do in the here and now? Well, what a question, huh? Um, you know, I, I, think, I think what we have to do is rediscover a fundamental friendliness between all of us where we sit on, I'm at, I, every morning, believe it or not, when I'm at, at Hoover, George Schultz walks into my office, 93 year, 94 years old, sits down and holds court. Now, for a guy who went to three years at a mediocre state school before the dean of students and I came to an agreement that I should leave and he'd mail me a diploma, <laughs> I'd, I'd been in a little trouble. That's pretty tall cotton. And I, and I, uh, and I asked him about how was President Reagan with such ordained views, ordained in the sense that he knew who he was and where he stood. How did he and Tip O'Neill get along? And George told me one morning, he said, one night they were going over the schedule for the next day, and on it was Tip O'Neill coming over again for an evening 
of drinking Irish whiskey and telling jokes that we don't tell in front of our ladies. Um, and his set, one of the secretaries, schedulers, looked at him and said, Mr. President, she said, isn't Tip O'Neill your political enemy? And he just, in his kind way that was just part of his heart, he said, not after 6 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> what has happened to him? I come back to an America that I've been gone from for most of a decade, or if I was here, I wasn't really here. I was thinking about how better to, to kill certain people. And I come back, and now I'm wandering around this country, and it's like everybody's angry at each other. I mean, we're Americans. I mean, let's start with that and, and, and remember that and, and remember that those two could go after each other all day long, and then they get together at night and enjoy each other's company. Mutual respect, admiration, love. I think we just have to get back to a fundamental friendliness among all of us and don't just go to places where you talk in an echo chamber. Listen to others. And I used to tell my American officers, I had 60 nations on my staff at CENTCOM. And I'd tell my American officers, I said, I don't want you just willing to listen to other people and their ideas. Remember, not all the good ideas come from the nation with the most aircraft carriers. I want you willing to be persuaded by other officers. And I think for the Marine Corps, especially as a naval force where you can't ever carry enough gear or enough men on the ships for when you land against the enemy, you learn to use cunning and good ideas. And oftentimes those good ideas come from others. And I think we have to reopen our conduits of friendly discussion with those that we completely, dis especially with those we completely disagree with, willing to be persuaded by them but have a good, rousing discussion about it, and then go to church together or synagogue, go to the bar together. I'm very big on having an adult drink in my hand. I'm never more eloquent than at those <laughs> points. And, and make... <laughs> there you go. All right, you're on. We'll, we'll hit it. Thank you. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, very so much. Wait. Yeah, yeah. Start, start, start. So I, I said... I, I did say that was the last question, but I lied. So since, um, nobody told you to stand and applaud. So since the, a large part of why we're here today, just to really honor and recognize Marine Corps University and the foundation, you can't leave without answering the question of, what has your professional military education meant to you in your career and your life? Yeah, thanks, Jim, because I was armed with insight, uh, to use your, your slogan, General Drowdy and General Pratt, who carry this responsibility forward. I would just tell you that the Marine Corps reading list, all privates have to read these four books, all Lance Corporals, these six, all sergeants, these three. Generals get a new reading list when they make Brigadier General and that sort of thing. I was never bewildered by anything the enemy did in, for more than a couple of seconds, tactically or strategically. I always had a model of how someone in the past had dealt successfully or unsuccessfully with a similar situation. And I'm going to tell you young officers and young Marines in the room here how to make four stars. So you ready to take notes? Uh, one night, the Admiral, he, he leaned across the table. It was right after 9-11, fleet commander, three-star. I'm a one-star Marine. He says, the enemy is going to lose Mazari Sharif. said, the CIA and the Special Forces guys, are the bombing's going well. They'll fall back on Kabul. The Admiral had done his homework. He said, Kabul has never been held in 500 years. He said, they'll fall back on Kandahar. They're going to reinforce there. And he said, they'll have 10, 20, 25,000 men there uh, here another month. He said, can you get the Marines together from the Med and the Pacific, land in the southern desert, and move against Kandahar and, quote, raise hell? He never gave me another order, by the way. I said, yes, sir, I can do that. He said, OK. So he gave me an anti-submarine plane. I went up and I circled. And you're wondering where I'm going with this sea story, aren't you? And I'm circling that night, and I can see the fighting up north. They have telescopes that can spot a periscope 20 miles away. You won't believe what you can do over land with that. I mean, I was reading their everything. And they're fighting over near the border a little bit, spin bulldog, not too much of a hurrah, and there's this big, dark area down south. Now, young officers, I'll tell you how to make general. Fight enemy generals dumber than a bucket of rocks, okay? <laughs> because I'd done all that reading, and I still remember once where I hadn't done my reading for the week, so the battalion XO said, well, Lieutenant Mattis, you can just stay in your BOQ all weekend, 
and deliver me a book report Monday morning. Uh, and it better be a very fine book report. So I learned to do the reading. The end result was, thanks to the University Foundation and all those who forced that, when it was time to stand and deliver, I put fewer boys in body bags. So there it is. All right, we well, can't, don't, yeah, because I do have one other thing, which is, um, at the conclusion, please join us for a reception in the lobby. Now help me thank General Mass for inspiring me. Thank you.